Right, this tour, Hillbilly Nashis, Urban Rage Rebels of Black Power, crudely stolen from this book. But that the author was happy with that. <laughs> so, um, this book I found last year in the States when we were out travelling on a history trip. Hey! Yeah. <laughs> First time out of the country, this was book. So, uh, <laughs> what? Sure, That's Matt Fishbone, isn't it? Uh, right, um, so this book, a very, very interesting book because, uh, I'll come on to why in a minute, but basically, the talk's based on this book, but I'm using a few other sources. Very hard to get hold of at the moment in Britain, this book, so I've got a couple of copies off Amazon cheap. I apologise. see the radical history publishers sitting there. Breaking <laughs> under the chairs. And this one as well, staying alive, but I'll come on to them in a minute. So the talk's about, and this, I mean, this is a good quote. The talk's, it's specific to a case study on, I mean, look at the Young Patriots organisation. Sounds a bit dodgy now. Mm -hmm. um, and, and why it is an amazing bit of, uh, of history and why that history's been hidden, which is what I seem to do in every talk. Why don't we know this? Um, there's a bit more of a twisted, it's not just a, an establishment crushing of a history. This is um, a consequence, I would argue, of some of the politics on the left in the, in the US since the 60s, why this history is known about. Anyway, this is Fred Hampton, one of my heroes, if you don't know who he is. Definitely find out about him. One of the most important American revolutionaries, I would argue. I, mean, I don't agree with everything he said, but as a revolutionary, a very, very important figure in the 60s in America. Uh, and he said this, we've got to face the fact that some people, he's a Black Panther, head of the chapter in Chicago. We've got to face the fact that some people say you fight fire best with fire. So he's referring to black nationalists, you know, who were we put in a position of separation, set like kind of early Malcolm X, Nation of Islam, and that sort of stuff. We've got to face the fact that some people say you fight fire with fire, but we say you put fire out best with water. We say you don't fight racism with racism, we're going to fight racism with solidarity. And I think we'll come on to see why it's an interesting perspective, considering the way the Black Panthers are often portrayed, which is somewhat false, I think, about a lot of their uh, black power politics. So, um, I don't know what to do now, so I'm going to put on that. Okay, so quickly what we're going to do is we'll quickly go through the sources and why these, some of the examples of why I think this history is hidden. Um, I'm going to talk about Chicago briefly in the 1960s and, and, and uptown Chicago and the Young Patriots is the sort of central part of it. We're going to do a little photo essay, I've not done that before, so see how it works. I might play an interview and show you some pretty amazing pictures, I think. But they kind of tell a story, and I'm trying to show up. And then the Rainbow Coalition, which you might have heard of as something to do with Jesse Jackson. Yeah? Nonsense. Mm -hmm. It's originally an idea that comes out of this period of the Black Panthers and other groups, and we'll come on to that in a minute. Um, Jesse Jackson stole it, and they said, well, whatever, but you know, it wasn't revolutionary the way it was in the 90, late 1960s, early 70s. A little bit about FBI and COINTELPRO, if you don't know about it, and what the state responded to this kind of political activity. And a little bit about other groups, a lot of other white working class groups are very interesting as well, and some thoughts at the end. So thanks, Matt. Um, right, um, what I've done is collected some, again, some books you might recognise. Um, so this is a kind of, a, really to show that this history is quite exposed now, the Black Panthers. The Young Lords, if you don't know about them, they're kind of equivalent, started by Puerto Ricans, become a sort of Latino Black Panthers, so to speak, and the American <coughs> Indian Movement. So these histories are fairly well known. So you've got Bobby Seale, Huey Newton, you can see them on the shelves of this bookshop. Uh, David Hilliard, who was the communication <coughs> person in the past. There's Young Lords on the end there. Um, <coughs> American, the American Indian Movement. If you know, more Churchill was involved in that. It's a lot of books about American Indian Movement. But also, more recently, also um, Kathleen Cleaver, who was one of the most big prime uh, female movers within the Black Panthers. I didn't know that two thirds of Black Panther Party was female in 1971, but anyway, um, which is very interesting. Uh, also, I should Shakur, I think this is sort of more recent stuff. You probably heard of the Angola Three at the media a year or two ago. So there's plenty of history out, and there's loads more than that. So, you know, well represented um, in terms of, uh, in, in sort of breadth, but I, don't, I wouldn't always say that well represented historically. But there's plenty of stuff out there, and if you put the next one on, because this lot we're going to come on to are also extremely well represented historically. The Students for Democratic Society, which led partly through splits in the Weather Underground, if you know Weather Underground, Urban Guerrilla Group operating in the 1980s, all kind of surrendered and got away with it. Uh, mostly. 
and the Black Liberation Army, which is also kind of some people from the SDS went into as well. So you've got outlaws in America, way the wind blew. This one here, I think, was quite a big seller. Bill Ayers, his fugitive days, one of the members of the Weather Underground. David Gilbert, the Black Liberation Army. Um, also, other books, there's a song book from the SD the Weather Underground. There's like um, interviews with men, you know, books really about people's biographies, I suppose. Stuff about the SDS, bringing the war home. There's plenty of material about the uh, about this sort of um, sort of current in the 1960s. Right, next slide. Thank you. Right, what about inverted commas, working class histories that don't fit in either to black power as such or into the student movement and the anti-Vietnam you know, War? Well, these are two classics here. This one I definitely recommend. So. This is about the League of uh, Re uh, Revolutionary Black Workers in Detroit and the drum, Detroit, uh, the, the Dodge Revolutionary Movement and the sort of extremely advanced politics of, of factory workers and communities in Detroit that was coming together in the 1960s. So a different angle to the Panthers but related to the Panthers, amazing but Also, you know, so there's some bit of history there about Detroit. There's also a bit of stuff come out recently about rural, the Midwest, working class activists who got involved in the politics in the 60s. So this uh, Roseanne Ortiz Dunbar famously read Red Dirt, which is about her life as being brought up in Oklahoma and becoming a revolutionary. And also this one, which if you really want to find this, will piss you off. I mean, the Red Deck Manifesto. So we asked me if we were going to talk about Red Decks today a little bit. But this one is a very angry critique of the politics of or identity politics and how it's applied to white working class people or white, I hate this word, trash, as he says. And he reclaims, so angry, but but you know, there's very few and far between, particularly talking about white working class revolutionaries in the 60s and 70s. These three books all came out recently, I don't even see it. The first one was obviously the one we talked about, Hillbilly Nationalism, Urban Race, Rebels and Black Power, which is talking about the groups we're going to come on to in a minute. Staying alive which is basically a book about why the white working class in the States ended up voting Republican in 1980 with Ronald Reagan and the, and the kind of collapse of the sort of more radical sections of the working class and the unions. And finally, this other one, Truth and Revolution, which you can see. I mean, you, get all, you can get Truth and Revolution off the AK store if it's in there. Truth and Revolution is a story, is a kind of uh, history of the Sojourner Truth organization and similar white group that was involved in factory struggles and other struggles that came out in the 70s. But apart from this, and these all come out very recently, all those other books are from the 90s, 2000s, this, this is all really recent. And it's the first sort of stuff that's coming out where she's actually trying to look at some of the hidden history of that period, particularly around the white working class. So, if you want to... Okay, so I want to talk about... Um, organization of white working class people in Chicago. And what's really interesting about it wasn't just established uh, white working class communities in, in Chicago that met with the Panthers and it wasn't established communities as such. It was a whole load of new immigrants. Now, if you know anything about the US, you'll know that, for example, after the Dust Bowls and the collapse of agriculture and the Depression in the 30s, large numbers of black workers moved from the south northwards. Right? They end up in places like Oakland in California, building like aircraft carriers in the Second World War, huge industrial complexes. The loads of black workers go to Detroit, where you know, Detroit becomes 80% African American because of the car factories in the Second World War. I mean, they said the Second World War was won in Detroit to produce so much material for the war. So you've got this, so there's a, a consciousness of the migration of southern black workers northwards, right? Uh, but there's very little knowledge about the, the migration of southern white workers northwards. Now this, this white patch here is a thing called the Appalachians. It's like a kind of low bills really, I think. I'm being... This is the Appalachians. So you can see it runs from like right from New York all the way through Virginia, Kentucky, Tennessee, North and South Carolina, down to Alabama and Georgia. It's the Appalachians, which is kind of hillbilly country. It's where like left-wing film directors go and make films like you know Deliverance or something, you know. It's it's treated like that as a sort of crazy area. Now what happens after you know, these people who live the, the rural working class of the area are pretty much um, affected in the same way that the rural black working class in the south is, is affected. They have to move. Mines <coughs> shut down, 
there's no jobs, right? People get discarded. The, the labour relations in the whole Appalachians are appalling. So you know, you, you're a miner, you get ill because you've got black lung, you're chucked out, no work, got to move. Okay, so through this period of post, particularly during the Second and Post Second World War, you get huge numbers of white working class Appalachian hillbillies moving to these cities, Chicago, Detroit, Cincinnati, and St. Louis. And they're doing that because they're trying to find work, desperate. work. So you start to get enclaves forming in these cities. And I'm going to particularly be talking about Chicago and, and a place called Uptown, but the whole area of Chicago which was kind of colonized by people from the South. And when I say the South, I mean it in a political sense. Uh, you know, obviously these, these are the Confederate states. States here, part of the Confederacy, the capital of the Confederacy is in Virginia. You know, so it, it is the South, in inverted commas. So if you want to click the next one. Right, what I'm going to do is, uh, I'm going to play an interview in a minute by a guy called Pye Thurman, who was a, uh, one of these migrants to, to Chicago. And um, he's going to talk, he'll talk about some of the conditions in the area and how, what, what it was like in the area of Uptown in Chicago amongst this big southern community that just arrived, and uh, revived over about 10 years in the 1960s. Um, and also, he will talk about, I'll play the interview in a minute, he will talk about a street gang called the Uptown Goodfellas, uh, who were both basically a street gang, who eventually became politicised through the arrival of the Students of Democrat Society and Jobs or Income Now, which was a community programme the SDS were running. These two things meet, street gangs meet student revolutionaries. And they then formed the Young Patriots in 1969. Why have we got this flag up? We'll find out in a minute, because this is their symbol, right? And we'll find out why that was in a minute. Stars and bars. So if you want to just play this interview loud. That's the other one, Matt. Stop this one. But for the majority of people, they might have patients. About the way it's really loud. So, for the young guys, all they saw was poverty, all they saw was, you know, this messed up with us in the street. Let's go do something. And uh, some of them were some of us were hustling on the street. You know, the answer. Can you play it now? Uh, uh, myself being 17 years old, I'm here. Uh, I couldn't find a child. I didn't have an education. I didn't know what I did. 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 Any time that there were three or more on the street, you would be considered gang, or you could be taken to jail, you could be. So you had to get off the street. There's no place other place to go. So, so there was a lot of frustration. There are a lot of uh, confrontations with, with the police. So, essentially, what happened was <clears throat> there were uh, the students from the Democratic Society, for instance, came into the community and they formed an organization called Joint Child Forum. <coughs> and what they wanted to do was to reach some of the people. They want to, what they want to do is they want to get some people to get them to um, start buying their rights to try to make some uh, conditional changes within the community. Uh, at the same time, they were talking about the civil rights movement and how in other these other communities and other you know, parts of the country and down south that they're fighting for you know, justice and rights. Well, you had a very good community because you had a southern You know, and the majority of the oppression that blacks were getting was in the south. And uh, other, basically, culturally, uh, uh, the southern white people are French people. They stick to them. You know, they won't be bothered. Uh, so, the cause of the 
show a few pictures now. What, what High Thurman is talking about is this moment where you know, the, the community is new of these southern whites in, in, in parts of the uptown Chicago, big area, and they are already in street gangs as, as teenagers. What he really talks about and what was shocking to the whites, the, whites did, the southern whites did not come from privilege. Right? They came from pretty shockingly bad backgrounds in the, in the Appalachians. A lot of them were minors. A lot of them were textile workers who had lost their jobs. Many of them were affected by black lung, the miners, and brown lung, the textile workers. They moved there for this desperation to get work. There is no work. So they arrive in these areas, usually through relatives and connections, like you know, many of the populations move through those connections. They end up in this area, and they are, they are faced not only with like, the poverty of the area, bad housing, terrible housing, in fact, also the problems of no work. You know, men are forced to like have to pretend they've left their partners right, to get welfare. So, so there's this, <laughs> you can see a parallel with this country actually, there's racism in the 1970s about the black family. You know, men are having to pretend to leave their families, i.e. creating single parents and stuff, and to be able to get welfare benefits. So the whole system of people living in f fake addresses or around their mates so that their partners can get welfare, otherwise you couldn't get welfare. So there's a whole, Sort of intermeshing of poverty and, and, and you know and sort of you know kind of deprivation in these areas, right? But also, and very interestingly, when you read the accounts, particularly in this in this Hillbilly's book, of people talking about the area of his life, extremely violent policing going on at these white areas. Uh, to the point where somebody famously, one councillor came actually, they got a councillor to come down and actually look at the area. And he kept saying, why are there bullet holes everywhere? There must be gunfights every night. And they said they're all police bullet holes because they gun us down. I mean, people are getting murdered. He talks about this. Corrupt police, and actually a police that treats them as a bunch of, quote, fucking hillbillies, right? which is interesting. You know, I didn't know that there was that kind of, like, sort of, I don't know, inter-community, sort of, inter nissan hatred between the police and some sectors of Chicago society and the hillbillies. But yeah, there is. So what happens is, is people like Junebug Boykin, who to me doesn't necessarily look like somebody who is a revolutionary, 
because of images of what revolution is meant to look like. This man's a revolutionary. <coughs> so he forms, along with a load, a load of other people that they, who are in street gangs, uptown good fellas, they form a campaign against police brutality. You can see it. And they march on the police stations, right? So this is like southern white street gangs marching on police stations. You click the next slide. Um, you'll see in a minute. What's also going on is they're self-organizing. Okay, because their initial self-organisation is about their own community and about their problems, right? You get the Students for Democratic Society and Jobs or Income Now, which is a kind of community campaign they're launching in different cities, but it takes off in Chicago. So you start to see sort of formal political protests happening all at the same time as this other kind of self-organised activity of going to police stations and going to council meetings and how we go. Um, click the next slide. This is um, another another joint march. A bit, you know, I'll be talking about how, the, the renewal, housing renewal stuff, is because what the plan for Chicago City Council, which under the, that stage was under Mayor Daley, a notoriously right-wing and corrupt figure in Chicago, he's what they're doing is they're taking these sort of hillbilly slum areas and just going right, we'll stick the college in there and just move everybody out. <laughs> so that, so this way you see this urban stop and urban new renew renewal. So they say, well, what about us? Where's the money going? Where's all this urban renewal money going? It's not going to us. It's going to get us out of here. That's what's going on. So you see a lot of demonstrations are starting to happen around this subject. And then if you press the next one, Matt, this is um, a good picture of joint organisers right, in, early on in, in, in uptown Chicago. And the next one. And groups like this start to form in that period. Rising Up Angry is a group that come, again comes out of street gangs and becomes a well-established political group in between. It's a demonstration by Rising Up Angry here. And again, you know, it's not normally, I, you know, I don't, I don't know, it's, I call this it psychobillies. Rockabilly, really, you're right again, but only for psychobilly, you know. Anyway, um, so, you know, there's rockabilly gangs are forming into political organisations. They're turning themselves from street gangs into community political organisations to so fight for the community. Let me click the next one. Um, here you can see a rising up angry meeting. And already you can see by the late 1960s that these meetings are, are being held in, in, in jointly with other members of other community organisers from other ethnic groups. Next picture. Next picture. This is an interesting picture. Um, does anyone know what Breakfast for Kids program was? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly. Panthers. Well, not just the Panthers, because I'll come on to why in a minute, but these groups were all operating together by the late 60s. And in Chicago, the Breakfast for Kids program is a big thing pushed certainly by Fred Hamilton in the Chicago chapter. Um, but you don't just get Breakfast for Kids programs in, in African American areas, you get them in. Hillbilly areas. So this is a Breakfast for Kids program in uptown Chicago. I'm going to click the next one. I'm going to brief, oh, do you want to explain what Breakfast for Kids, kids Sorry, yeah. What it was is um, basically the Panthers program initially was like, you know, that we, we have to ask the community what they need and what they're pissed off about and work from that. That's how they start and then they form a 10 point program. But the Panthers, well, one of the things is to say, well, people said, you know, basically people, kids weren't getting fed properly, they couldn't afford to feed them. So the Panthers set up a, a, you know, a huge program feeding thousands of children for breakfast. So you came in for breakfast, got your breakfast, went to school. So they, this, this is a part of the program. But this idea expanded, not just through the Panthers, but into other revolution groups and the groups that were associated with them. So this is the, in Uptown, I believe. This is an interesting demonstration. Now we've got the, the kind of coming together of not only groups in the community or different ethnic community groups coming together to organise themselves, but this is a, um, a demonstration in support of um, subversion in the US Armed Forces, basically. This is supporting like GI mutineers, deserters, uh, the Sailors Mutiny, SOS, Save Our Sailors, you know, built on the aircraft carriers of the US Navy, stop them going to Vietnam, you know, air repairs of sabotage, you know, there's a whole load of activity between about 1969 and 1973 in the US Armed Forces, which basically finishes the war off, in my opinion, in Vietnam. So this is a demonstration, but you see, these, these groups are also intervening in this, but they're intervening from a, you know, from a black and white working class perspective, which is support these soldiers who are stopping the war, okay, rather than, you know, remaining separate from them. So bring everybody together. Next picture. 
Okay, you start to see magazines. This is an indoor paper, so this is interesting. The Patriot, right? And if I saw that on the street, I'd probably hit the bloke who's holding it. And read what it says. We are the living reminder that when they threw out their white trash, they didn't burn it, right? And this paper, I, I, I was going to play the interview, but what's really important about you know this Confederate flag? Thurman says like. We, we, we knew, first of all, that the, the, the Confederate flag was misunderstood in the North. It's, it's a, it's a, it, he said it was a rallying thing for Southern whites, but not in the way that was, we necessarily imagine. He said, so it's not, you know, a lot, so a lot of people associate it with slavery, obviously, quite correctly. But actually, what they did, the Patriots, and we'll talk a bit more about them in a minute, but what they did was take the symbol and say, right, we're going to reclaim this and turn it upside down. Right? We're going to change its meaning. Right? So they used it as their symbol. Now it's very interesting. This is a woman called Peggy Terry as well, which I'll come on to in a minute. She's one of the big join organizers early on in Chicago. Do you want to click the next slide? Okay, some more groups here. White Lightning, we were talking about earlier on from New York, which is dealing which is addicts dealing with like the problems of, of heroin addiction in the city, but from a community and revolutionary perspective. All about healthcare taking over community police, the first drug clinic set up and all that kind of stuff. Another paper here you can see, and then click another one. These are all coming out of white working class groups in general. This is really important. So you've got a Black Panther here standing next to a, a, a young patriot okay, at a conference. And the Panther said to them, why sort of, what's this with the Confederate flag? Right, and they said, well, it's about time we change its meaning. And they, the Panthers realized very rapidly that these people were confronting racism and trying to alter their own history. And they're very clear about that. I mean, so although the symbol itself is, I mean, to a certain extent, is entirely contentious, but what they were trying to do was, was smash that a little bit, to, or to wreck its, like, its, its interpretation amongst their own community as well. Okay, so that's why it's an important symbol for them. Um, this picture is very important, so I'll come on to why in a minute, but basically it's a cartoon. It says there's two, two senators here talking. And this link says American Indians, Puerto Ricans, poor whites, blacks. And it says in the bottom, well, what worries me, Senator, is they're all getting into step. And that's a direct reference to what is the Rainbow Coalition. So you click the next one. And this is a very famous picture of the Rainbow Coalition press conference. So what we've got here, the Rainbow Coalition is where these white radical groups, community organising groups, like of which there are many, but Young Patriots is a central one, meet with the Panthers. I'm going to show you a film, hopefully in a minute, called American Revolution 2, which just shows you the first meeting of the Young Patriots and the Black Panthers. But it leads to what becomes the Rainbow Coalition, which is a coalition of Black Panthers and other Black Revolutionary groups, the Young Lords, Latinos and Puerto Ricans, like the Yellow Brotherhood, which is Japanese Americans, uh, the American Indian Movement, the Young Patriots and other white working class groups in Chicago. And they meet together and they say, right, we're now going to form the Rainbow Coalition. They actually took a badge and just painted rainbow, different colours on it. Famously, the Young Patriots founded the idea of the Rainbow Coalition. They painted it. They were the ones who created that badge. So this is a really interesting picture. It's 1969, right? And this is the first public... Um, press conference of this new organization which is going to unite the working class across Chicago against gang divisions, against ethnic divisions, but recognizing that they organize in their own communities first. So not parachuting, like I think the left did for a while. Parachuting, they just jump into community and go, hey, I'm a you know, <laughs> so, so this is a very, it's, it's, this is an organic meeting. It's not come out of like some political initiative. It's already there. The organizer's already there. This is just the coming together. Press the next one. And finally, this is a picture much later in the 70s of young patriots and black panthers in Oregon. So it's just a kind of family meeting. So this continues. These, these links still continue to this day. Right, we'll look at the next one. Okay, right. I want to I just play... Before I come on to it, I'll, I'll talk about the Rainbow Collection in a moment. If you could play American Revolution 2, that would be... Right on. Right on, yeah. American Revolution 2. Now, what this film is, is a really interesting film that was made of, of a meeting between uh, Bob Lee of the Black Panthers and some other Black Panthers and members of this Appalachian white working class in Uptown. A public meeting where the two sides meet pretty much for the first time. So I'll just play a few minutes of it and you'll see the dynamics of it, which are quite interesting. Yeah. Those guys were incredible. 
when they start moving people out, you know, the problems. It's, uh, you know, they were moving into some other place. And they were saying, like, where they move into, they would probably move them out of Chicago or in some other community. I'm from Missouri. It's 1969. This is poor people's park. That's what this little campaign button's all about that we've been passing around to people. People that want to take over and have a government for their self, that they'll be treated right. That's what it's all about. I want to introduce a man that's come over tonight from another part of town, but he's fighting for some of the same causes we're talk, uh, fighting for. And start the meeting off. So I'm going to introduce you to Bob Lee here. Let him travel a little while. Bob. I'm a black pound, I'm sexually into the black pound. Bob, he's a security man. He's a sister Ruby. Uh, we met with Junebug and his brothers uh, last Wednesday night, last week, in the Church of Three Crosses, where we both had a chance to get together. Half of the year, are here. Half of the year. Yeah. Bug town. Okay. Well, anyone who lives in uptown, I mean, brown, green, yellow, purple, or pink. But I'm saying past the year, and you have to tell us what we can do and what we can do together. We come here with our hearts open, you got to supervise us where we can be of help to you. One thing we're going to have to do is put our heads together and figure out where we can help uptown, help the people in uptown. Right. And the thing is that. Now, I want everybody who's got any questions at all to speak them up and say them now. Who's here is concerned people? Who, who's here that wants to see this thing move? Right on. Well, the first thing we talk about now is how we're going to organize. You know, where we're going to organize. We all of us right now, man, figure out like what we want. You know, what, what do we want? What do you want? What do you want, man? What do you want? In your community. What do you want here? Don't lay back on the cuts, man. It's, you know, like... We're not moving, man. You know, you're free of pain. You want to take berets off, man? Or, or what, man? Uh, you, uh... Propose that you do a lot of marching and things like no, that? No, sir. No, sir. You're right here. Marching, please. No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. The thing we're about is this is your community. This is your community. Let's move. Yeah. And we can't move without you. Yeah, we can't move. We can't move without you. We might have left side, stop by him. The basic unity to start with. Uh, that was the Right. Okay. But then, see, the thing we're going to deal with is the concept of poverty, man. We've got to get rid of the color thing. See, I mean, concept of the same thing that welfare up here, people on welfare up here, that people receive ABC, right. you know, that police brutality up here, that rats and roaches, uh, that's poverty up here. That's the first thing that we can, we, we can unite on. That's the common thing we have, man. And we can unite on poverty, and unite on the concept of poverty, you know, everything comes color, man. Right on. The building's not fit for dogs to live in, but humans have to pay $144 a month, right? They sold, they sell the building on the new ownership. What we need is understand among the people, right on. coalition between the people to step together right on. and take them owners and cut them over here in the lake somewhere. Right on. Right on. <laughs>
in that period, right? the Black Panthers are the Bet Noir, the public enemy number one in American society at that point in 1969. I mean, they are seen not only in the, by the general public as dangerous revolutionaries, but also as black power racists who are going to attack white people. That's how they're being portrayed. So do you want to go to the, the original slide? Yeah. So the, the point about that is just for that meeting to even occur was pretty unusual. But for that meeting, you know, for, for, for white Southerners to be addressed by a black person even was, was problematic, certainly. But to be addressed by a black panther, the most evil black people in the United States at that point, was pretty incredible. But the point is, these people do meet. And there's a really interesting story about, it was, I think, the second meeting after that, where basically both sides were meeting separately. Like I said, Bob Lee went back to the Panthers and said, look, you know, I've done this meeting. He had to argue with certain members of the Panthers who were going, what the fuck are you doing down there with all those people with Confederate flags and they're white racists? And he's arguing with the party. Similarly, the young patriots are arguing their community. They're going, what the hell did you bring all these mad black revolutionaries down here? They're crazy nuts. They want to kill us. So both sides are arguing. And then that, later on that night, they. You know, Bob Lee goes over to Uptown again and meets with the Young Patriots and, and does another public meeting like that. And, and he, he's, he's got so worn out with all this arguing about, you know, in, in their respective camps about whether they should actually carry on, which they do. He walks out of the meeting, to have a bit of, he just walks around the streets of like this white area of North, uh, North Chicago. So he's walking around the streets having a rest. He gets pulled by the law. Right? As soon as the law is here, he's already been followed by the FBI and everything, they grab him, right? put him up against the wall, they say, right, and he's not even sure he's going to be taken to a police station, he thinks he's just going to get a beating, which has happened before. He's in the police car being driven down the street, and they drive right past the church where they've just had the meeting. And some of the young patriots outside having a cigarette and spot him in the police car, pull the whole meeting out. A hundred people come out and just surround this police car, right? And Bob Lee, Famously says, you know, he said, I'll never forget it. He said, because despite our differences and problems and these political issues, this community came out and, and de arrested me from the police. In their community, a black revolutionary evil person from the police. That's how much they fucking hated the police in that area. And he said, Bob Lee said famously, I apologise for the language, but he says, I can just see now, I can see all those white motherfuckers staring at the police and thinking, oh, I am so pleased I know you. <laughs> and it, so these moments are important because it, it showed, you know, that whatever their differences that the community will come out and always defend people that, you know, they trusted from their community or from other communities against the police. So it's a very important moment and Bob Lee goes on about it. Right, I just want to, can you go through to the slide we're on? Yeah, if you keep going, keep going, keep going. Yeah, keep going. Uh, keep going, all the way through. And we'll just talk about the um, Rainbow Coalition. I don't know if go back on. Right, okay, so what, how, do, how does this Rainbow Coalition, so these, that meeting is an early form of, of the community level, communities meeting right, going on. And eventually, um, in the same year that this sort of activity is happening in certain cities, this meeting of, 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 of black and white community and radical groups. Um, the Panthers call a famously a conference in Oakland in 1969 called the United Front Against Fascism Conference. And the main reason they call that conference is one because of you know the call for community control of police in areas. That's what one of the things they're putting forward. How do we control the police or take over policing? And the second thing is they're now suffering severe state repression. So the conference is about you know the state response to Black Panthers and other radical groups, the new left, 
Puerto Rican independence and lots of other political organisations that are being undermined by the FBI. Um, and some young patriots go to that conference from Chicago. So they've already had some contact with the Panthers. They go to the, you know all the way across America. And they go to this conference, which brings together all these groups I mentioned. Um, from that and the continued meetings, everybody comes together and says, the young patriots and the other groups say, right, we'll form this, we're going to form this political coalition. So what we do is we organise our own areas and then we form a cross-city coalition of groups. Like, and that will be called the Rainbow Coalition. Um, if you click the next one. Three days after the first meeting of the Rainbow Coalition, three days after the coalition meets for the first time, the FBI launch a major operation against it. Now, I'm not going to go about Cohen's Hell Pro, it's definitely worse if you don't know about the counterintelligence program the FBI ran, arguably from the mid 50s right way through to the 70s, probably now. But, um, and, and, and if you really want to get annoyed, then go and watch the film Mississippi Burning and realise that that's a load of nonsense. Because that portrays the FBI as kind of being this sort of neutral federal force that's non racist and you know, trying to deal with the Klan and the local police force that you've seen in the Mississippi Burning. Absolute nonsense. The, um, the FBI were using informers. They had about one in four Klan members over as an infiltrated informer at one point in the South. They were using them to murder um, people like the Freedom Riders coming down to the South to, to get back into the vote. That, so the FBI are using groups to do their dirty work. In fact, they're organising murders where the FBI operatives were involved in murdering like, people fighting for democracy in the South. So they launch COINTELPRO, it becomes very directed in the 60s against exposing, disrupting, misdirecting, or otherwise neutralising radical black groups, in particular other groups, that they did regard as subversive. Their main thing was, they said, was we must stop any messianic black leader appearing in the 60s at the civil rights movement. And funny enough, they're all dead. But anyway, I'm not making a I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but they're all dead. Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, Fred Hampton, and many others. So they had a clear policy to neutralise those people. Um, the kind of thing they were unleashing on these organisations was you know, constant surveillance, misinformation, harassment, arrests, bad jacketing, that's where you set people up for being cops who aren't. Uh, fit ups, I desperately put loads of pamphlets away and other people in the radical left for, you know, on fake murder charge or you know, set them up for murders they didn't do. Uh, agile provocateurs to a level which is almost unbelievable, we discovered, but I'll get to that later. And also, um, you know, lots of informers and stuff like that. But they also went for state-sponsored murder. Now, the reason there are a lot of murders by the state in this period, either using proxy groups or inter-Eastside murders caused between political groups, in, you know, kind of encouraged and exacerbated by the FBI. But these two I'm going to pick out in that year of 1969 because they are very key. I think they're very important. Um, Bunchy Carter and John Huggins were shot dead by, they were Panthers who were shot dead in Los Angeles in the University of California, Los Angeles union meeting where the Panthers were about to take power in the, in the student union, basically take control of the student union in the UCLA. Uh, and they were at the meeting and they were gunned down. Now why are these people are important? Why Fred Hampton and Mark Clark are important? Well Bunchy Carter and John, Bunchy Carter is a street politicised activist. He's come out of street gangs in LA and he provides a link between the Panthers and the street gangs very, very important, Huggins as well, and they're at the meeting. So it seems like anybody who was trying to connect political organisations to the community or to street gangs or any other form were prime targets because they were dangerous people. They were connecting groups together. Similarly, Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were murdered by the police. This is Fred Hampton, unfortunately, drugged and murdered by the FBI in 1969, along with Mark Clark as well, and five other people were shot by the police. But the Fred Hampton again, Fred Hampton's one who's saying breakfast for kids program, community stuff, and you fight racism, you know, with anti-racism, with solidarity, right? You don't fight racism with racism. So these people are murdered by the police in that year, amongst many others. But I think the point is is that they certainly targeted people who were trying to expand their political organisations into the community. Can I click the next one? So that kind of repression is unleashed on the Rainbow Coalition almost immediately it forms. Okay. Right, I just want to talk about some of the other organisations and stuff that's going on very briefly. Um, 
Now, if you know about the Students of Democratic Society, you'll know that they, that, that, you know, the weathermen come out of it. There's a big split in the conference in June 1969. So all this activity is all happening in 1969. It's all this expansion out of political groups into the community, cross ethnicities, rainbow coalitions, FBI repression, murder of activists who are trying to do this. And at the same time, the SDS split into three groups, really. Those who went for direct armed insurrection into the Vietnam War, in my opinion, fairly naive, the weathermen. Um, people who went to form a national organisation, a kind of workers' party, and those people who went back into community organisation. And those people, these people, were the ones that were helping facilitate these processes in Chicago, New York, and in the West Coast, of bringing you know, a multi-racial approach to it. So they, they are some SDS organisers, but most of the SDS organisers who come out of the universities are actually rejected by the late 60s. What the, these community groups say is, is that we all organise in our areas, you need to go and organise with students because you're students. So they kind of diss the SDS and they take their own path. And these groups, along with the young patrons, basically take their own path with the Panthers. So rising up angry, you saw some pictures of them. They came out of the join. Uh, and their whole thing was like, you know, you have to root politics in working class life, in the radicalism of working class life, not in like ideologies or big political organisations. The October 4th organisation in Philadelphia in 1971, they were sort of fusing the two things again. This fusion of labour activism and community organising comes out of Detroit and the League of Black Revolutionary Workers. It's like the most, some of the most advanced politics that the US has seen comes out of Detroit. And finally, White Lightning, I mentioned, you know, said capitalism must dope people genocide. So they're coming from the position of the whole dope explosion in the 70s, like they mean heroin. And, and you know, talking about healthcare hospitals, they take over hospitals, they open clinics, and they organise self, self organising amongst addicts. So, do you want to? So, I'm just going to sort of finish off now and do three minutes of questions. But, um, so, why, what happened to these groups, and, and what, you know, what happened in general to that movement? Because that movement is, is, is forming in the mid 60s and, you know, explodes at the end of the 60s and then is dead by the mid, mid 70s. Well, as I mentioned earlier on, there is, I'm not going to go into great deal because I have time, but there is a whole story about the organised work, working class and unions and how a large section of them ended up voting Reagan. And that has an impact on this. But also, I think importantly, why is some, to some extent why this history is hidden? Because it's all being researched now, finally, after all these years. A lot of it's to do with identity politics, because obviously the concept of white privilege, for example, which I think most of you may have heard of, it's, it seems to be coming into Britain at the moment, but it's big in the States for the last 20 years. I mean, it'd be difficult to stand a meeting and talk about white privilege to those hillbillies, I believe. So, it, to a certain extent, white working class radical groups in Chicago don't fit the model of modern, postmodernist politics, so they get written out. They cannot, they have to. If you're going to stick by the idea of pure white privilege without any class analysis, they're out of the picture. And that's why they don't appear in any of the books, because no one's looking. So, you know, to a certain extent, that's why they get hidden. But also, I think, you know, these groups were trying to do this. They were trying to disentangle, to work through these problems of class and race and capitalism in the United States. They're trying to actually, on a grassroots level, deal with it on a direct level. Not in theory in, the, in academia, not in some you know, pontifications of some left-wing party, but on the ground where it's done. And that's why it's extremely interesting. That's one of the meetings, I think. You know, I tried to give you a bit of an anatomy of a meeting. But also, as I said, you know, that this is all going on at the point where half the new left has decided it wants to take the war home, you know, from Vietnam and start an armed struggle. So, you know, they reject that SDS end of things. They reject that as ridiculous, right, and isolate the nonsense. And they go back into the community. And finally, um, a well-known political commentator once said, it's funny how the SDS were obsessed with race, whilst the Black Panthers were obsessed with class, which I kind of told you something about the politics at the time. So um, I won't name him, Ian Bone, but um, he's kind of right. I think this is a very important point. And it is something which perhaps the politics of the 60s is not understood very well. Why? Students were talking about race. The Black Panthers were talking about class, if you read their stuff. Um, do you want to click the next one? Right, so thanks to people who have got about three or four minutes, I think. Um, but the authors of this book were very helpful and mates. And these are the books again. So, Hillbilly Nationalists, Truth and Revolution, Sojourner, Truth Organization, Staying Alive, and Detroit, Do I Mind Dying? There's a few minutes for questions after that.
right. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? A bit of a mishmash? Hannah? Um, well, um, just that last thing that you said about the STS being, um, well, not, not being obsessed with his race, but that being, you know, sort of at the forefront. Is, is, could you explain a bit about why the White Lightning Group call themselves White Lightning? And what's well, the, the, why there's the White Panthers as well, which I didn't even mention. You know about the NC5 from Detroit, White Panthers fall in Detroit, so there are other groups. Well, why were they called White Lightning? I think it's just the word for heroin. Or no, um, right? oh, you know the experts here, oh my god. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> He's written about them. Yeah, so I'm writing a history of White Lightning. <laughs> um, is his name Fangina? Jill Fa Fagiani uh, Fagiani. started White Lightning and he was uh, Italian American. And I asked him, why do you call it White Lightning? And he said it was just to use, use it as a mixture of things. And it was, there was this uh, moonshine that was called White Lightning that they drunk. And there was a kind of speed that people took that was called white lightning. Yeah. And it was also, you know, he said, you know, we wanted to be lightning in the struggle and that. It was, uh, you know, a mixture of things, yeah. There you go. But was the fact that, um, was it in a sense that they thought that, um, you know, the Black Panthers call themselves Black Panthers, why shouldn't we, as no, white what, people, call, them, call themselves white? Why, white Lightning that? started out as a mixed, uh, in a mixed race group. It was, it was set up in a therapeutic community, like a rehab uh, place yeah. in, in New York, uh, that was called Logos. And it was very authoritarian, and Joe Fagiani and some of the others got pissed off with it, and they set up a new organisation called Spirit of Logos. And that was a multiracial group. And then the black ones and the uh, Puerto Ricans and the others left at the time when they occupied this uh, health clinic, oh, yeah. the Lincoln Detox Center. And so the white ones were left and they, some of them didn't actually want the black people and that to leave, but they were left as the white ones and that's, that's why they became white light. So it wasn't that they split off, um, they, were just, they were just left behind, yeah. Yes. Sam? Was it so was literally the, the decline of the coalition to do with like, the police shooting people? Or was there success as actor? Or was it oh, yeah, I haven't gone on too, too much. I, mean, I think the, the first point is, is that Fred Hampton's murdered like in December 1969, which is literally months after the coalition's formed. And that murder of Mark Clark and, and, and Fred Hampton it really causes shock and awe amongst all of these groups. So it's huge, you know, lots of protests and stuff like that. But what it causes is sections of the movement in the Panthers, but also in, in the SDS and others, to go for the armed struggle option. Okay, there's already an argument developing in the Panthers at that time about you know whether you're going to follow a sort of third world liberation position along with armed struggle, whether you're going to go for the community activism like Fred Hampton or the, so there's a split. In the, a kind of split happened there. Same as like in Europe, like the RAF. Yeah, it's like, are you going to disappear off into what, you know, isolated armed struggle and, you know, and all this sort of you know, glorification, or are you going to actually carry on doing the really important stuff? So that problem is there already. And all the, the problem with the murder of Fred Hampton is, is that it pushes the people who are going to go into armed struggle, gives them a kind of sign to go, and they disappear and go underground. Parts of the Panthers do as well. but. But, so it, it, it does create significant problems at that point, you know, I mean, not just because they murdered one of the main organisers who supported all this stuff, but also because it causes splits at that time. I, wouldn't, I, don't, want to, I don't want to build up the FBI coming so much uh, programme too much, because I think it's a get out clause for the left to go all in the press, that's why we been. But they clearly coming to about a massive impact on the Panthers shattered the organisation across the country, you know, within a couple of years, so. I would say the FBI stuff did have, you know, it did have a massive influence. Because they've got, got FBI agents um, getting into these pamphlet groups and doing things like they're being the East Coast and the West Coast yeah. and turning up as an East Coast uh, pamphlet and West Coast meeting and shooting branch leader. And so then there's those divisions within the Panthers, within the gangs within the Panthers as well. Yeah. That, 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 you know, it's, it's, it's fucking crazy the amount of stuff that the FBI infiltrated and how they got in. You know, you're talking about um, 
through the 70s and there's plenty of other activism going on there, you know, they all go through the early 70s but I think that the split in the pamphlet has definitely affected all this kind of stuff, like, you know, the split between those who go for arms travel on the east, west, coast, sort of problems, all that, a lot of that is exacerbated by the FBI, no question. Also, they're under attack, I mean, they're not able even to do most of the organising by the early 70s because they literally are being locked up, like, you, know, under, you know, they're being harassed all the time. But on the other hand, what I would say is, why I talk about this split of people going towards armed struggle, why I'm saying that is because, it, it, you know, in a sense, that's probably, in a sense, what the state were after. Because they, the response to the Rainbow Coalition, which on one level you'd say, well, what are they worried about? Black and white people across the city of Chicago are going to make it a better place. You know, absolutely hammered. I mean, David Gilmore, you know, 75 years for driving a car, basically. But I mean, so what I mean by that is, is that though, that, that it causes a split because it, it means that the community groups stay isolated from the wider political groups. That's what happened. It's good. But, you know, again, read, but I haven't gone on about the 70s really, but it carries on right away from the 70s and really organising. And, you know, these people are still out there as well. They're not, you know, people who lie down. A lot of the people who appear in that period are actually still community organisers or doing stuff. And I think yeah, he, is. he is as well. Yeah. Oh, well, sorry, time. Time. <laughs> Can I just ask one question? You said at the end the SDS focusing on race, the Black Panthers on class, but you build it as race, gender, and class. I'm wondering if you make any comments I, about gender. Yeah, sorry, I should have done that, but I should, that's really bad, because I, I wanted to show part of another film. But anyway, you're absolutely right, but what, what, what is interesting is I noticed amongst the young patriots, and also Rising Up Angry, and a lot of the other groups, uh, these white white class groups, have, it is not immune to early feminist ideas at all, you know, that sort of nascent feminist movement comes out of the 70s at all. If you go through the book, I mean, I just recommend looking at the pictures, you'll see that like within those organisations, they are focused on gender as well. So they're focusing on the problems of you know, ethnicity and difference and that, but they're also focusing on the role of women. And it doesn't come out that, I mean, that, that meeting is very interesting because, you know, just to get people to speak, they're forcing people to speak on them. But, but the, there is a definite consciousness, and I, I, I apologise for not going on that deal, there's a lot more I could have talked about as well, but it's in there and it comes right away through these organisations into the 70s. And many feminist activists early on, who work class feminist activists, have come out of join or um, these groups and they then then joined the feminist movement and became sort of fractions within it. But they but certainly they were ahead of the game in my opinion. It's interesting that they were probably ahead of the game in terms of gender than even the SDS were. But it's a debatable point. Anyway I better shut up because we've got to have ten hours. <laughs>